Getting good Pokemon for competitive play was not easy in the first few generations of VGC, the official format for the Pokemon games. But starting with Pokemon X and Y, Game Freak would improve upon the team building formula a little bit for every game that came out. First, we had legendary Pokemon getting three guaranteed perfect stats, as well as the Destiny Knot passing down five of the parents' IVs while breeding. But what improvements did their sequel generation, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon add? And did it ease the team building process? That's what I aim to tackle in this video. To do this, I'll be recreating Naoto Mizobuchi's 2019 World Championship winning team from scratch on a freshly completed copy of Pokemon Ultra Moon. I will also be comparing it to how long it took me to complete the World Championship teams from 2016 in Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire and 2022, which were in Sword and Shield. This is to see how well it compares to the games that came both before and after it. So please check those videos out if you haven't already. I'll be matching the stats at level 50 of Naoto's Pokemon along with their natures, moves, and items. My goal with this is to capture what it would be like for a new player who has just completed the latest Pokemon game to build a competitive team, and to find out what Game Freak thought was acceptable insofar as team building goes. With that said, I am not allowing any glitches, the most notable of which is the day skip technique from January 31st to February 1st in the original Sun and Moon, allowing the player to instantly finish whatever is happening in the Poke Pelago. This lets you EV train and farm for rare items very, very quickly. I also won't be allowing the clone glitch that can happen when you turn your game off while you're trading. Lastly, I won't be allowing BP farming from Pokemon Bank. It wouldn't be fair since I've got like 10k BP saved up from 3 years of not using Bank at all. The reason I'm putting such heavy restrictions on glitches is to not give Game Freak any extra credit by allowing techniques that they didn't intend or they patched out later. These things were certainly not planned by the devs when it came to team building. So what is allowed then? Well, I will be allowing online trades for version-exclusive Pokémon, or abilities that were no longer available that used to be events. I will also be allowing the use of RNG manipulation, because I'm me. That's kind of my channel. <laughs> uh, you might say, well, this is unintended by the devs as well. Why don't you ban it? First of all, RNG manipulation is neither a glitch nor a malfunction, and it never got patched, even though they likely could have removed the initial seed verification that we use. Secondly, RNG manipulation doesn't cause the game to do things it normally couldn't, and has always been legal for use in VGC. Lastly, because RNG manipulation is just me controlling the luck, think of it as me getting very lucky with my soft resets instead of me exploiting something. All of these spreads would have been obtainable if I was just soft resetting. But I speeded up doing this. It gives the game a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. In addition, since this is Gen 7 VGC, I can use any of the games from Sun and Moon to Ultra Sun and Moon, and I can also use Pokémon Bank for transfers. Pokemon from games before Sun and Moon aren't allowed to compete in VGC, but you can use it to send up Pokeross or Good Dittos or something. Lastly, I'll be trying to make the team as quickly and as efficiently as I can. I'll have a live timer running in the upper left hand corner of the screen at all times, and after every major section is completed, I'll say the total time and I'll compare it to how long that section took in Alpha Sapphire and in Sword. Without further ado, let's start the setup. So the first thing I had to do was find Naoto's team. It's got a full breakdown on VictoryRoadVGC.com, which covers the EVs and IVs of the team. Now, if you're like me, the first thing you'll notice is the fact that Naoto has four legendaries on their team. Groudon, Stakataka, Lunala, and Tabuthini. At first, I thought this wouldn't be such a big deal, because the Ultra games have tons of legendaries in them. But then it dawned on me. Groudon is an Ultra Sun exclusive, while Lunala and Stakataka are Ultra Moon exclusives. So I would have to play through Ultra Sun just for one Pokémon. I don't need Ultra Sun for anything else. And I have never talked about this much before, but let's be clear. The idea that I need to own and play through two of the exact same video game just to have one version exclusive legendary is ridiculous. The financial barrier is a minimum of an extra $45 for the extra game along with the yearly cost of Pokemon Bank. This might not sound like a lot of money, but adding unnecessary financial barriers to competition is never something to praise. And this is blatantly pay to win. It is rewarding people who have more money and time to afford and play through an extra game. I also want to be clear, a lot of people joke around saying that Pokemon wants you to buy both copies of the game, but I don't think this has ever been the norm and I don't think it should be. I did not start owning both copies of the Pokemon games until I was done with college and had a job in my own field. Many players are far younger than that and will be balancing competition with work and school. We should not encourage this type of behavior the idea that version exclusive legendaries are allowed to exist this way is appalling insofar as the competitive scene goes. And people may say, well, just trade for it. First of all, I thought of this. Surely it's not worth it to play through an entire game just for one Groudon. So I tried using the GTS to find one, and it is not usable. I mean, literally, the game crashes whenever I hover over a Groudon in it, so I can't even search for one. 
The second issue is, the Pokémon do not show what nature they are in the GTS, and there is no way to change your nature in this game. So I can't actually know what I'm getting, even though I could fix up the IVs later. So that angle is a wash. So the only other option would be convincing someone else to trade me their Groudon. I don't think this is particularly realistic, so the only option is for me to play through Ultra Sun from scratch. The reason I am adding this game's playthrough to the timer and not Ultra Moons is because it's reasonable to have to play through one game to compete and collect Pokémon, but not two of the exact same game. I don't even think it would be reasonable to have to play through two different games. So to me, it's a justified con to this generation's competitive aspect. Lucky for me, I don't actually have to play all the way through Ultra Sun. I just have to play most of the way through it. I have to make it up until I defeat Ultra Necrozma, and then I can start the search for Groudon. I do not normally comment on the quality of the game that I am playing, but playing through Ultra Sun like this was torture. What I did was receive my starter Litten and then trade it over to my completed Ultra Moon and level it up there using Chansey SOS battles. And then I blasted through the game as quickly as I could with a level 60 Incineroar, which was not that fast actually. It was 7 hours and 15 minutes of mind-numbing cutscenes where I barely did anything other than press the A button. By the time I made it to the Aether Paradise, I was losing my mind. It's okay. To the computer, get the info on Cosmog. How turns around and goes... And then I leave. And then we go upstairs. And then I have to fight Faba again. What did you find as the Ultra Beast? I do not know how speedrunners handle playing Gen 7. It is insane. Before I move on to finding Groudon, I actually need to get an adamant Pokemon with the ability Synchronize. This took me about 30 minutes as I reacclimated myself to RNG Minipping in the Alola games. But with my L Gym caught, all we have to do is ride the Ultra Warp Ride to find Groudon. Easier said than done though. Let's go over how this minigame works and why it will take me so long to find a Groudon in it. So the Ultra Warp Ride is a minigame where you ride a legendary Pokemon through a wormhole to find other wormholes that can lead to rare Pokemon. You have to avoid the blue orbs and gather the yellow orbs. If you run out of your shield, you get sucked into the nearest wormhole. There are five different colored wormholes, white, red, green, blue, and yellow. Groudon is exclusive to the yellow wormhole, and all five colors are just as likely to appear as the other. Once you enter a wormhole, you get exactly one Pokemon encounter, and if it's not who you want, tough luck, you have to leave the wormhole and then go into another one. On top of that, each color wormhole has four levels of rarity, based on how many rings are around it. There's zero ring, one ring, two ring, and the three ring wormholes. Three rings are guaranteed to have a legendary Pokemon within them, and two rings seem to have about a 25% chance to have one in it. There's no actual statistics online, this is just anecdotal for the 25% thing. The amount of rings you can get on a wormhole is based on how long you've been traveling on the back of the legendary four. Shooting for only three rings is not optimal because at best they're a 5% chance to appear. But two ring wormholes have a 16% chance to appear, so they're a bit more common. So oftentimes I aimed for them, but then if I saw a three ring one, I would go for it. The final issue is that Groudon is one of five legendary Pokemon who could appear in the yellow wormholes. Now, catching one of these legendaries in the wormhole does remove it from the pool of potential Pokemon who could spawn, but being a freshly played game, I don't exactly have the catching tools required to do that. I also don't want to remove valuable Pokemon like Heatran from the pool, who could be good on other teams. So after five hours of searching, I finally find the Groudon. And now we're ready to start catching Pokemon for the team. That is insane. <laughs> so I have four Pokemon to catch and two to breed. The plan was to catch the four legendaries and then move on to breeding afterwards. As you saw, before I found my Groudon, I caught an Adamant LGM for Synchronize. And we're going to need to do that again for hasty, careful, and modest natures. But I'll do them after Groudon is actually caught, because those Pokemon are going to be obtained in my Ultra Moon game, not my Ultra Sun game. The nice thing about legendary Pokemon in this game is that three of their six stats are always at max value. So for Groudon, who only needs five stats at max, I only need two 1 in 32 random rolls to go my way. The Synchronizer adds another 50-50 roll on top of that, and that's not so bad, right? Right? Wrong. It is a 1 in 3,677 chance to occur. These are close to the odds of 1 out of 4096 to find a shiny. And I have a bunch of shiny hunters here who will tell you that 1 out of 4096 odds can take months. It's ridiculous. To have an 80% chance of seeing this exact Groudon, you would need to do 6,000 resets. Each reset for a legendary in this way takes 1 minute and 15 seconds, aka 125 hours of resets. And that's only for an 80% chance to have it. 
Yeah, it could take longer, but it could also take less. But I'm not willing to risk those odds. This is where you must be thinking, well, this is where the new mechanic known as hyper training saves the day, right? Well, you would be wrong. Hyper training is a new mechanic introduced in the Alola games that lets you raise a Pokemon stats to its maximum value if it's not there already. Provided that Pokemon is at level 100, and you have a rare item known as a bottle cap to spend on the training. It costs one bottle cap per stat, or one gold bottle cap for all six stats at once. These items are rare, but there's a few easy ways to get them. You can find them fishing in bubble spots, uh, in the Poke Pelago Isle of Fun, or in the Festival Plaza. Fishing is inconsistent and slow. It's basically just fish spam in a spot until you get a bottle cap or a gold cap. I can't find concrete odds of this anywhere actually, but it's low. I did like 20 fishes in a row and got no caps from the Seafolk spot. Poke Pelago is even slower, and you can also only find gold bottle caps there, which sometimes you don't even want all six stats maxed. And you'd have to wait 48 hours to see if you could get one at all. So the only real option for this, for farming quickly and efficiently, would be the Festival Plaza. The Festival Plaza is a multiplayer area, much like Joint Avenue in Pokemon Black 2 and White 2. I personally never used it at all during Gen 7's lifespan, and from what I gather, most people did not as well. You can meet players online and build up different shops to get rare items using a special currency known as FC that is only used here. But this is where the main problems for Festival Plaza begin, and it's only sort of because Ultra Sun and Moon are no longer the main games. Uh, let me explain. You see, throughout 2017 and 2018, there would be what is referred to as global missions. It required everyone who played online to sign up for and meet some in-game goal, like getting a bunch of BP Mantine surfing. And if the goal was met, every player who signed up would get a ton of FC. Even on a failure, you'd get 1000 FC. Without this, there isn't a particularly good way to farm FC. You've either got to do the battle agency, or have one of the treasure shops give you like lottery tickets so you can win FC that way. Farming FC this way is really slow. And if you want to get bottle caps this way, you have to have two 3DSs. One with the two star treasure shop and one without it. This shop gives you a bottle cap 100% of the time on its first use. So you can install it by talking to the player's 3DS who has it, then get the bottle cap, and then uninstall the facility and rinse and repeat. The issue? This costs 100 FC every time. And this actually isn't the worst part somehow. You see, you also have to level a Pokemon to 100 if you want to hyper train. And that is very, very slow in these games. You either have to use the Poke Pelago's Isle Evil Up, which won't even get a Pokemon to level 100 after 48 hours. You have to use Chansey SOS Battles, or the Three Star Rare Kitchen, which is a Festival Plaza mechanic. I'll be using the SOS Chanseys later on, so I won't talk about them too much here, but it's really only good to get a Pokemon to around level 50-ish. After that, it stops giving as much EXP and is a real slog. So what about the Rare Kitchen then? Why is it not good for this either? Well, this facility lets you raise a Pokemon's level by spending FC here. There's various meals that you can buy, and most of them just raise your level by one. They also have level cap. So if you're above a certain level, they won't work. But the two best meals, the Rare Dinner and the Rare Buffet, let you raise a Pokemon's level by 7 and 9 respectively. The Rare Dinner costs 100 FC and stops working at level 79. The Rare Buffet costs 300 FC and stops working at level 89. The typical method here would be to level a Pokemon to around level 50 using SOS chains and then start buying dinners until you have to use buffets. My favorite part of this is that there is no way to use a meal to get to level 100. Because the highest level you can use any meal at is level 89, and that meal gives you 9 levels, you cap at level 98, and you have to use SOS battles or something to finish the levels off. Truly insane. The cost of this is also obscenely high. You're probably spending 1200 plus FC on every Pokemon you would need to get to level 100, which in my case would be 4 different legendaries. The amount of time it would take to get all that FC without global missions is absurd. The kicker to all of this? The final Festival Plaza global mission was in June of 2018. This world championship, this team that I'm building, August of 2019. So if you're a new player grinding for caps without them, and you've been playing this game for a while, I hope you held on to FC for over a year and didn't need to bottle cap things for older formats. Okay, so I have proven that hyper training isn't the solution everyone thinks it might be. And I'm also not really in the mood to soft reset Groudon for five days, so what do I do? Well, as usual in these videos, I'll be using a technique known as RNG manipulation. This allows me to control the luck the computer is producing in Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon without any hacks or modifications to my 3DS. This will let me get any Pokemon with the IVs and nature I want without having to do the miserable bottle cap and FC grind. Like most computers, the 3DS cannot produce true random. So Game Freak implemented a pseudo-random number generator algorithm called Simmed Oriented Fast Mersenne Twister. 
This algorithm is a formula that takes the 3DS system tick, date, and time, and what buttons are pressed on game launch or reset, and then combines them to form what's known as the initial seed. From the initial seed, the game moves the RNG forward at a rate of 60 frames per second per the amount of NPCs that are in that area, including the player character. This means that the more NPCs there are in a given area, the faster the RNG will move forward. It is doing this because the game is doing a check every frame to see if an NPC or the player character blinks or not. And if either one of them blinks, the game pauses the RNG advancements for that character specifically for anywhere between 30 to 60 frames. Then it resumes their movement again at 60 FPS as usual. Because this algorithm is public, three months after Sun and Moon's release, RNG was doable for every Pokemon in the game. RNG was widely public and known for the entirety of the Alola games, and the Ultra games had it on day one. So RNG manipulation in these games has four steps. First, I must determine the seed, which is essentially the starting position of the RNG. Second, I use the seed to search for my target sometime in the future. Third, I must plan the target approach using calculators and timers to ensure consistency. Finally, I must execute the approach, encounter the Pokémon and either succeed or fail, and then use that information to adjust my approach next time. The first challenge here is the initial seed. Because the seeding uses system tick in its formula, which is a nanosecond timer, this is impossible to control. So what we have to do is find the initial seed instead. We do that using the loading spinners that appear on the save file select screen and a program on my computer called 3DS RNG Tool. For some reason, they randomized the start position of these little loading indicators, and their position is chosen via the main RNG of the game. But without any NPCs or player characters loaded in, the game's RNG doesn't move except to create the save spinner's positions. So what I do is hit A to load the save file select screen, input the end position of the spinner into 3DS RNG tool, and hit B to go back to the title screen. I do this about 8 to 10 times until 3DS RNG tool calculates my initial seed for me. I use the end position because it's easier to tell than the start position, and since the needles always take the same amount of time from start to end, end positions are always consistent with specific start positions. Once we've got our seed found, we use the 3DS RNG tool to predict when a specific stat spread will show up that we desire. If there is nothing within a few minutes, I usually just soft reset the game and check the next seed. Rinse and repeat until something is close. But once I do find a spread I like, I input the given wait time into a timer that beeps rhythmically so I can encounter Groudon at the right time. If I miss, I simply adjust that timer by how early or late I was, in terms of frames. So all in all, it took me 1 hour and 16 minutes to get this 5 IB Adamant Groudon. But why did it take so long? I mean, yes, this is a lot faster than the predicted 125 hours of resets, but Emerald RNG also moves at 60 frames per second, and it doesn't usually take me an hour to do that. So, like I mentioned earlier, the more NPCs that are in an area, the more difficult an RNG minip is, and Groudon actually does have an extra NPC listed in the room. I think it's the legendary shadow itself when you see it on the cliff when you walk in, I'm not actually sure. But basically, because the RNG advancements can slow down or speed up based on when an NPC or the player blinks, the timer gets less and less consistent the longer of a wait time that you have. After having the same issue with the remaining synchronizers I needed, as well as an hour of stack attack attempts, I decided to learn a new technique for this RNG that would give me more available spreads and more consistent results. So whenever you go into a submenu in this game, the RNG stops moving. This is because, like the title screen, all the NPCs and the player character are unloaded to save memory. The QR code menu also has the same randomized spinners that the title screen does. This allows us to use those spinners to re-identify our current position in the RNG after we wait a certain amount of time. What I can do from here is always make sure I start the same amount of waiting time away from my target Pokémon spread, decreasing the chance blinks have to desync me, and increasing consistency for the timer. But also, this lets me target spreads that would otherwise be very far away by combining the QR technique with the Festival Plaza. You see, the Festival Plaza has 8 NPCs in it, which moves the RNG really, really fast. This can turn a 25 minute wait with 0 NPCs into a 2 minute wait with 8 NPCs. So now what I do is I find a spread that I want, I go into the festival plaza until I'm less than a minute away from my target, and then I find my position with the QR code spinners. I usually wouldn't go for spreads that were more than 10 minute wait via the festival plaza this way because that still probably would be wasting time in the end. Despite using this newer method, Stack Attacker proved to be more challenging than Groudon to get, probably because of the rarity of the spread. It needed to have either a 16 or 17 in defense, and a 0 or a 1 in speed. Both of those with 0 EVs are going to be the same stat at level 50. Overall, this took 2 hours and 40 minutes to get this 3 IV, 0 speed, and 17 defense lonely stack attack up. Yeah, it's longer than Groudon, but with my new technique perfected, it's time to move on to the hardest nip I would be doing in the game, Cosmog. 
You may be asking, why are you receiving the gift Cosmog instead of RNG Manipping the Lunala? Well, there's two reasons. And the main one is to preserve a Master Ball. I'll need that to catch and manip Tapu Fini. Otherwise, I would have to either go through the arduous process of catching a Legendary without a Master Ball for either Lunala or Tapu Fini. Cosmog here will just join your party, there's no catch needed. The other reason is that Nebi, Lily's Lunala, has 8 NPCs around it, which would make the RNG extremely difficult. So I opted to catch it and then headed to the Reverse World to get my Cosmog. I had to catch Nebi because you need it for the cutscene that gets Cosmog to spawn. Cosmog is the toughest because despite having less NPCs than Lunala, there's still 3 here. In addition to that, because it's level 5, telling what stats it will have will be difficult. The general process was, I found a seed, and if it had a good stat spread, I'd wait in the plaza or use QRs to get close, and then I would catch it. After the catch, I would run to Pony Plains and fight a Chansey or two to level it up, while recording what EVs I'd gain from fighting them. This way, I could check the stats a bit easier. The reason I can't use the IV Judge is because I don't have enough eggs hatched yet. In hindsight, it might have been better to do the breeds before I did this, but I really don't think this wasted very much time. In the end, it took me 3 hours and 24 minutes to get this 4 IV, 0 attack, and 19 speed modest Cosmog. Vinny is the same difficulty as Groudon, just one nearby NPC. And the method is also the same as before. Find the seed, advance using the Festival Plaza, and get close with QR codes. And just like Groudon, it took me 1 hour and 12 minutes to get my 5 IV, 0 attack, modest Taboo Vinny. Up next was breeding for Salamence and Incineroar. But before them, there's some setup I would need to do. And first on the list was getting a good ditto. Now unfortunately, RNGing wild Pokémon in this game is rarely helpful. They don't come with perfect IVs, so anything like that would be very unlikely. In addition to that, you actually can't manip SOS battles, because the RNG is going at like double or triple speed and all the moves cause extra randomization, so I can't do that either. The only wild RNG I did in this game, if you don't count Stack Attacka, is for the natures for my synchronized Pokémon. And that's just because the synchronized Pokémon in this game have a really low spawn rate for some reason. So that's why I'll be using an SOS battle to get the ditto that I need. An SOS battle is a mechanic unique to the Alola games, where wild Pokémon have a chance to call for help, turning the battle into a two-on-one. A Pokémon can call for help so long as there's no Pokémon already on its side of the field. The more enemy Pokémon you KO in one battle, the more guaranteed perfect stats you get, capping out at four perfect stats total. Ditto can be a bit of a pain to chain since it will only have 20 total PP after it transforms, and I need to get to 30 SOS battles in order to get the 4 guaranteed IVs, so I did a few things to make the chain as easy as possible. First of all, you want a Pokémon with False Swipe to be able to lower Ditto's HP to 1. The lower HP the Pokémon, the more likely they are to call for help. Additionally, using the item Adrenaline Orb increases the likelihood they call for help, so I stock up on those as well. You can also use a Pokémon with Intimidate or Pressure to increase the chance they call for help, but I didn't have one prepped and I thought it would be too slow to level one up just for this Ditto chain. With my False Swiper prepped, I get a Trubbish and an Alolan Persian. I already had a Persian for my in-game playthrough, so I just caught a Trubbish really quickly. Then I fish for some Heart Scales and I teach Persian Switcheroo and Trubbish Recycle using the Move Relearner. Then, using the Move Deleter, I delete all of Trubbish's moves except Recycle. Lastly, I get a Lepa Berry from under a tree on Ula Ula Beach. The plan here is to have Ditto transform into the Trubbish, who only knows Recycle. Then, I switch into Persian and I use Switcheroo to give Ditto the Lepa Berry, which restores a move's PP when it runs out during a battle. Then, Ditto spams Recycle until it's out of moves. The Lepa Berry activates, giving Recycle PP again. And the next turn, it uses Recycle, which regenerates the Lepa Berry. Rinse and repeat infinitely, and Ditto can never run out of PP and you struggle to KO itself, and it will never run out of HP since I will never target it. While this setup does make the battle fairly foolproof, I did accidentally fail at a battle of 12 because a Ditto with a hidden ability appeared, which transformed into my pre Narina, where it then KO'd its own teammate using Sparkling Aria, and then I KO'd it, ending the battle. So after that, I learned to use Incineroar for the battles, since it has no moves that can hit allies. In the end, it took me 1 hour and 34 minutes to get a 4 IV Ditto. It had perfect HP, special attack, special defense, and speed, all of which I will need for different breeds. Next up, I had to do some prep for the breeding besides the Ditto. So the first piece of prep I did was find my Egg Seed. Egg RNG works totally different from normal RNG in these games, but I'll explain that when I get to the breeds themselves. Just know that I had to breed 8 Magic Carp and record all of their natures, and that's how I got my Egg Seed. This took 38 minutes, taking in the amount of time the Brute Force Seed Searcher took as well. After that, I realized I would need the Destiny Knot, which is an item useful for breeding. This costs 48 battle points. Normally in these videos, I have to do a miserably tedious battle tower grind for BP, but luckily, Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon have a different way to gain BP. Mantine Surf. This is a minigame where you do tricks riding on the back of a Mantine to set a high score doing cool surfing tricks, and the higher the score you get, the more BP you get. 
and I think it caps out at 50 BP after around 140,000 points. I first had to unlock all the tricks by getting high scores on every beach, then I moved on to the main grind. What I realized is that if I'm going to farm for 48 BP for a Destiny Knot, I might as well grind all the BP I would need for this entire challenge in one sitting. In total, I'll need 284 BP. For three move tutor moves, Tailwind, Hyper Voice, and Fire Punch. And then the rest were for items. The Destiny Knot, the EV Training items, the Assault Vest, and the Salamancite Megastone. The way this minigame works is that you try and gain speed by moving in a zigzag pattern while dodging Pokemon in the ocean. Once at top speed, which is an orange aura around you, you can head off a wave to do some tricks. There's five main tricks to worry about in Mantine Surf. Lantern 360, Primarina Twist, Starmie 720, Over the Gyarados, and Magic Carp Splash. You can usually get two tricks off in one jump, and doing the same trick two times in a row gives you less points. Starmie 720 is a basic move that gives lots of points, around 2500. The Lantern 360 and Primarina Twist are conditional. Lantern gives two to 3000 points if you do it on a tall wave and Primarina gives you the same, but on a short wave. Over the Gyarados and Magikarp Splash are one-time moves. Gyarados doubles the amount of points from your last jump, and the animation is so long that you have to use a shorter move after it that gives less points. But if you use it right, you can get 17 to 20,000 points from it in one jump. Magikarp Splash will give you slightly more points than Lantern, Starmie, or Primarina, but only once. If you combine it with a Lantern or a Primarina, the score for that jump is usually around 8,000 plus points, which is pretty good. My strategy was to use Ula Ula Beach as the starting beach because it has a pretty low amount of hazards for the amount of beach that it spans. Then I would get my speed to max and do Starmie 720s into either Lanterns or Primarinas. Then, when I could, I would get in a good Magic Carp Splash for around 8,000, which I would then double the very next jump with an Over the Gyarados. This whole battle point grind took me 1 hour and 34 minutes. Not bad when you compare it to Alpha Sapphire, where 96 battle points took me 2 hours and 14 minutes to get and in Sword, I got 92 BP in an hour and 24 minutes. So Mantine Surf is definitely faster than both of these methods. It was 284 points, remember, and I got it in an hour and a half. That's really good. The real downside to this is it's not passive, and the circle pad kind of makes my thumb hurt and my tendonitis flare up a little bit. Anyway, the last real piece of prep I had to do was get an Everstone. I got mine by battling Trial Captain Lima, which took like two minutes. Now I'm ready to do some Egg RNG. So the items that we collected for the Egg RNG are just standard breeding items. The Destiny Knot makes it so 5 of the collective parent stats are passed down to the child instead of the default 3. In addition to that, the Everstone makes whichever parent holds it have that nature passed down to the child 100% of the time. So Egg RNG is weird. It uses a different pseudo-random number generator algorithm than the main game, and it's called Tiny Mersenne Twister. This was actually made by the same people who made the main RNG for this game, and Tiny Mersenne Twister was actually the main RNG for Alpha Sapphire. So if you want to see more about how that worked in the context of those games, please check that video out. Anyway, the seed for the eggs is generated on save file creation, again with a nanosecond timer. However, after that, the egg seed only changes whenever you receive or reject an egg from the daycare. There is no timing involved at all. This means one, egg RNG is always faster than regular breeding. Since in regular breeding, you never reject eggs, you will likely skip over closer frames with good IVs in them. And two, this will be a bit tedious. This is because I'm effectively going to be doing regular breeding where I'm just counting how many accepts and rejects I get. Very fun. Anyway, the way finding my seed worked, as I said earlier in Mantine Search, was that as long as I had received no eggs on my save file before, the egg seed hasn't changed since the game's initial save was made, and all I had to do was breed 8 Magikarp and record their natures. Then, the 3DS RNG tool can brute force that string of natures against possible initial seed values, and then we have our egg seed. Now, if you have bred eggs on your game before, you can actually still find your egg seed, but you have to do 128 magic carps, and you're recording which of the 50-50 genders that you get on them. So, of course, I didn't want to do this, and I made sure to uh, not actually breed anything beforehand. <laughs> so, at this point, with my seed in hand, I searched for what kind of parent bagon I would need, uh, and I would need one with both 31 in attack and defense to get my target all perfect tasty bagon. Uh, this is because Ditto doesn't have either of those stats perfect, unfortunately. I wavered on whether or not to just try and RNG the Bagon or to SOS battle for one, and in the end I went with SOS battles. After checking with a few different initial seeds, two perfect IVs are just not common enough to make RNG minipping worth it. So after 30 SOS calls, I catch a Bagon. Unfortunately, synchronize didn't happen and neither attack nor defense were perfect, so I reset and I tried again. I still didn't get synchronize, but attack and defense were perfect on the next 30 battles that I got. 
So despite this LGM being useless, I did have an opportunity to get the egg RNG that I needed. So the first thing I did was receive 32 eggs in Reject 2, to get a 5 IV Bagon with a Hasty Nature, where the only perfect stat wasn't speed. Then, after hatching enough eggs, I went to the battle tree to unlock the IV Judge in the PC. You need to have 20 eggs hatched for this to work. I had not unlocked it previously because I was dealing with Pokemon who were at high levels so I could calculate their IVs using a stat calculator. Barring Cosmog, of course. Now that I can verify my eggs IVs, I then swapped out my previous Bagon with the Hasty one, and I gave the Hasty Bagon in Everstone. After that, I just had to receive 14 eggs in Reject 4, and I had my 6 IV Hasty Bagon. This whole thing took 3 hours and 4 minutes. It's not the fairest rep of Alola breeding because I counted both the SOS chain and the time it took to hatch extra eggs for the IV judge, so we'll see how Litten goes. Keep in mind though, it literally would have taken longer otherwise. This was only like 40 eggs total. Breeze often takes 60 plus eggs, especially with my limited 4 IV ditto. For Litten, it needs its hidden ability. This was an event distribution from Pokebank, so I had someone trade a Litten to me that had no perfect stats, the wrong nature, but the proper ability. From there, I received 5 eggs in Reject 3 to get a careful female Litten that has Intimidate and perfect HP and perfect speed. Now, the reason I needed a female Litten was because I have to pass on the egg move fake out from an Alolan Meow. Unfortunately, I need to SOS battle again. So I do another 30 SOSs for a perfect Meow, and I get one with perfect HP, attack, defense, and speed. After that, it's another 5 accepts and 5 rejects, and we have our all-perfect careful Intimidate Litten. This breed, even with the SOS chain included, only took me 1 hour and 30 minutes. Not bad. In total, getting all the Pokémon took me 19 hours and 5 minutes. This felt really rough while I was doing it, because every single RNG minip in this game feels tedious and just a smidge random. In Alpha Sapphire, this took me 47 hours and 8 minutes. So I think this may have been a bit of an upgrade. Well, how about Sword? In Sword, I had to catch all the Pokémon, but I also used Bottle Caps, Mints, and Ability Patches. Counting those, it actually took me 21 hours in Sword. So that goes to show that all these extra ways to fix a Pokemon up doesn't mean anything if it's not fast, easy, and accessible. So our new total time at this point is 31 hours and 23 minutes. Let's hope we can catch up in the back half and EV training is fast, which is what we're going to be doing next. For EV training, I have everything I need in order to do it except for Pokerust. Pokerust is an affliction the game can give a Pokemon that doubles its total EV yield. The main issue is that it's rare like 1 in 21,845 odds rare. Usually you can get it from online, like Wonder Trading or something, but if you're lucky, you do get it randomly. I ended up transferring it through Pokemon Bank from a game I had previously gotten it in. All right, with that said, I have everything I need to train. So let's go over how EV training works in Alola and my general methodology. EVs in Alola can be gained from Vitamins, Pokemon KOs, and the Pokepelago Isle Level Up. Let's talk about Vitamins first. Vitamins give 10 EVs per use and can only give 100 EVs total to any given stat. They're expensive, but luckily we got 55 big nuggets, aka around 1.5 million Poké Dollars from the post game, so they're often worth it to use. Usually I'll only use them if I need to get a stat to at least 100 EVs. Next up, let's talk about Pokémon KOs. Generally, when a Pokémon assists in a Pokémon KO, it receives either 1, 2, or 3 EVs. The amount that you receive is based on the species of Pokémon that you defeated. This can be enhanced in three different ways in the Alola games, the first of which is the power items. These items add 8 EVs to whatever stat they represent when we get a Pokémon KO. So if we were to KO this Wishy Washy here, which typically gives us 1 HP EV when we KO it, but I use the power weight while KOing it, I would now gain 9 HP EVs. The next helpful thing is the SOS battles. The moment a regular battle becomes an SOS battle, all EVs are doubled, including those from the power items. So in our Wishy Washy example, we would now gain 18 EVs instead of 9 EVs for every KO. And the last way to enhance it, as I mentioned earlier, is Poke Rust. This also doubles the total EVs of a Pokémon KO. This means in our Wishy Washy example, our 18 EVs becomes 36 EVs. This means that if we want to cap out a Pokémon stat to 252, we only need to get 7 KOs with Poke Rust while holding a power item within an SOS battle. Pokemon KOs and Vitamins will be our main method of EV training, but I figured I should also touch on Isle Evel Up. This is an island within the Pokepelago. It lets you gain EVs and EXP points, and the amount you gain is based on the amount of training sessions that you set up for a Pokemon to take. It takes a total of 63 sessions to max out a specific stat. This takes 31 and a half hours just for one stat. Not even the entire Pokemon. So, yeah, we won't be using this. For this type of challenge, it is way too slow. So my general plan is going to be to buff up a Pokemon stats with vitamins as needed. 
and then after that I will finish them off using Pokemon KOs with Poke Rust, the power items, and SOS battles. SOS battles are going to be the worst part here, as there is not always a 100% consistent encounter to start the SOS. A lot of the encounter rates can be unfortunately low. And then on top of that, they're not going to call for help every single turn, so they could take a bit longer if I get unlucky. So with the plant set, let's go over which Pokemon I use for the SOS battles. The first one I use is Wishy Washy for 1 HP EV in the Brooklet Hill Totem Den at a 40% encounter rate while fishing. For attack, I use Young Goose, Lillipup, and Mudbray on Route 4 for 1 EV at a 75% encounter rate. For defense, it'll be Alolan Sandshrew on the base of Mount Lanakila for 1 EV at a 30% encounter rate. For special attack, I fought Zorua in the grass at the Trainer School for 1 EV at a 30% encounter rate as well. For special defense, I use the Surfing Ambush Tentacle for 1 EV at a 100% encounter rate. Lastly, for speed, I use the Wingle on Route 1 at a 40% encounter rate. For the actual training, I use Alolan Marowak as my main battler. It has False Swipe to easily lower a Pokemon's HP to start an SOS battle, and it also has Aerial Lace, which is important because some of these Pokemon have accuracy-lowering attacks, like Mudbray with Mud Slap or Young Goose with Sand Attack. And Aerial Lace is unaffected by these moves. It's also easily able to one-hit KO any of the Pokemon that I am training against. I will also use the remaining PP of my moves to keep track of how many Pokemon KOs I've done. In addition to that, none of the Pokemon I will be training will actually be battling. The EXP share item gives the EVs from the battle to every Pokemon in my party, which makes training really easy. First up, I trained Litten, which needs 252 HP, 4 attack, 4 defense, 236 special defense, and 12 speed EVs. So I gave it 10 HP ups and 10 zinc. Then, I KO'd 6 Wishy Washy, 4 with the Power 8, 2 without. After that, I KO'd 3 Tentacool with the Power Band, and 7 without. After that, it was 1 SOS Mudbray and 1 SOS Sandshrew, and I capped it off with 2 Carbos. This was not the most efficient path. I also messed up several times by forgetting to put vitamins on the Pokemon. You really have to pay attention and plan out your EV training properly. This all took me 35 minutes. Hopefully I can improve it with some error correction and better planning on my next target, which is Stack Attacka. So for Stack Attacka, it was a simple 252 HP, 252 attack, and 4 special defense. For this, I opted to go with no vitamins and just did 7 SOS KOs on Wishy Washy and 7 SOS KOs on Young Goose using the power items, and 1 tentacle for special defense. This was a bit faster at 24 minutes. The SOS battles slogged things a bit because they didn't always call the ally Pokemon for them, but I thought it was worth it to save the money for the vitamins because they're so expensive. After Stack Attacka was Groudon, who I needed to give 108 HP, 156, and 244 special defense EVs to. So I started with 10 HP ups, 10 proteins, and 10 zinc. First I did attack, which was sort of a weird path. I KO'd 1 SOS Young Goose for 36 attack points, and then 1 non-SOS Alolan Dug Trio, which gave me 20 attack points, capping me at 156 attack EV. After that was 2 SOS Wishy Washy without the power weight, which in total gave me 8 HP EVs. Finally, I KO'd 7 Tentacle with the power band in an SOS battle to gain my 244 special defense EVs. In total, Groudon took me 17 minutes and 43 seconds. Cosmog was up next. It needed 244 HP, 164 defense, and 100 special attack EVs. I gave it 10 HP ups, 10 irons, and 10 calcium. After that, I KO'd 8 Sandshrew without the power belt, and then I KO'd 6 Wishy Washy to finish off the training. In all, Cosmog was the fastest yet, at 16 and a half minutes, likely because of the special attack being fully trained via vitamins. Tapu Fini was the final legendary, and they're up next. They needed 244 HP, 4 defense, 252 special defense, 4 special defense, and 4 speed EVs. So I started off training by giving them 10 HP ups, then after that I went on to train special attack. So I SOS chained 7 Zorua with the power lens on. After that was 1 SOS Sandshrew, Tentacool, and 4 SOS Wishy Washy. I then finished them off with 1 Carbos. Finny in total took about 25 minutes. A bit longer than I wanted, but it's because of the variety of stats that I had to train that it took so long, I think. Finally, we have Bagon, who needs 36 HP, 244 special defense, and 228 speed EVs. I gave them 10 Zinc, and then I KO'd 1 SOS Wishy Washy for 36 HP EVs. Then I did 4 SOS Tentacool, and 7 SOS Dwingle. This round took about 22 minutes, and it seems to be about the average if you plan everything efficiently, I think. All in all, EV training is a bit frustrating in this game. The Pokémon are all fairly far apart and low encounter rate, and not getting an SOS every single time is also a bit frustrating. Well, how long did it take in total then? 2 hours and 28 minutes. Alpha Sapphire was actually only 5 minutes faster, that's pretty crazy. This felt like more of a slog than that game, but in reality they're dead even. Did Gen 8 improve anything? Well, no. It was slower by an entire hour at 3.5 hours. What I'll say is that while both Alpha Sapphire and Ultra Moon are faster than Sword, 
They also both take more setup. You need the power items, Poke Rust, and the setups to defeat Horde battles or SOS battles. In Sword, you need none of that. So yeah, it's faster here, but a bit more difficult. I think most players these days would prefer the Vitamin Spam, even if I don't necessarily. Our new total time at this point is 33 hours and 52 minutes. This is actually really good so far, I've turned my opinion around. That's because you have to consider we have all the BP we need for items and moves. Speaking of, moves and levels are up next. The first thing I'm going to do for the moves is go by all the TMs I'm missing and find them on the ground with pickup. First, I need U-Turn, which I purchase in the Mali City Poke Center. After that, I get Trick Room from Kahili in the Hano Grand Resort. After that, I pick up Protect from the Heia Heia City Pokemon Center, and then I fly to the Trial Site in Pony Path to pick up the Dragon Claw TM. Every other TM required I had already gotten through the natural course of the adventure in the single player campaign. From there, several Pokemon could already be completed fully. The three Pokemon I can complete right now are Groudon, Tapu Fini, and Stakataka. For Groudon, I give it Dragon Claw and Protect via TM, and then I flew to Ula Ula Beach to teach it the Fire Punch via the Move Tutor. It already knew the Precipice Blades move from Level Up. Then I taught Tapu Fini Scald and Protect via TM. After that, I used the Move Reminder to give it Moon Blast. I had a bunch of heart scales from fishing and not encountering Wishy Washy while I was EV training, and it already knew Nature's Madness from Level Up when I caught it. Lastly was Stakataka who I taught Gyro Ball, Stone Edge, Trick Room, and Protect to all via TMs. Now, the last three Pokemon we need to evolve via level up, and they also have plenty of level up moves they need to learn as well. My goal was to level them up all as fast as possible, so I used as many ways to boost EXP as I thought reasonable. The plan is to level up using the SOS battle mechanic by KOing Chansey and Pony Plains. In Alola, they removed the extra EXP you gain when battling a trainer, so it actually isn't any better or worse to fight them versus a wild Pokemon and Chansey slash Blissey, who Chansey can sometimes call in an SOS battle, give the most EXP points in the entire game. In addition, the lower level you are compared to your opponent, the more EXP you gain. And all of my Pokémon who need to evolve are like level 10 through 20, whereas Chansey and Blissey are all in their 50s. On top of that, I gave them all the Rainbow Beans in the Pokémon Refresh minigame to increase their affection towards me. This gives them boosted EXP points as well. Finally, a Pokémon who can evolve via level up and are past their evolution level gain an EXP point boost as well, so I will wait as long as possible to evolve them so they can keep getting that boost and get to the levels that they need to faster. I don't have a cool infinite battle setup trick like I did for Ditto. My plan is just to false swipe a Chansey, use an Adrenaline Orb, and then just start brick breaking and aerial acing Chanseys and Blissies until I run out of PP on my Marowak. Litten needs to get to level 43 for Flare Blitz, and then it needs to evolve into Cinderor to learn Darkest Lariat. Cosmog, unfortunately, needs to be level 67 to learn Wide Guard, and it needs to evolve into Lunala to learn Moongeist Beam. Lastly is Bagon, who needs to get to level 49 to learn Double Edge, and then it needs to evolve into a Salamence. And that's really the whole plan. In one SOS chain, I got both Litten and Bagon to the levels that they needed, and I used one rare candy I had on my now Shellgun to evolve them into a Salamence. It learned both Protect and Double Edge from level up, and now I just need to use the BP to teach it Hyper Voice and Tailwind. After that, despite my Tauracat realistically only needing one level, I started up another SOS chain until it evolved into an Incineroar. From there, it only needed one more move, U-Turn, which I got via TM. Now it's time for the final chain, and I want to use this section to demonstrate to you why this is so slow for hyper training and getting a Pokemon to level 100. You see, Cosmoc at this point was level 55. It has the EXP boost from the Pokemon Refresh mechanic, and it gets a boost for not evolving into Lunala but now it's the same level as the Wild Chanseys. This drastically lowers the amount of EXP I get from Pokemon KOs. It took me a literal hour to gain 12 levels from here. And the closer I got to level 100, the slower this goes. So if I had to soft reset for a Lunala with 19 speed and zero attack, I'd have to have leveled up for like four to five hours minimum to get Lunala to level 100 via these Chanseys for hyper training. On top of the SRs and bottle cap farming, I'd already have to do to get the Pokemon perfect. And lastly, yes, I know I don't have a lucky egg, but it requires you to have caught 50 different Pokemon, which I didn't, or farm it off of Pelipers. I honestly just didn't think this was worth the time when I only have Lunala that would take a long time for me to level up. In any case, Lunala is done leveling now. I just need to teach it Trick Room and Protect via TM, and we're done with the moves and leveling. In total, it took 2 hours and 8 minutes to get all that sorted, and half of that was literally just on Lunala. So how does this compare to other games? Blissey bases in Alpha Sapphire proved a bit faster, clocking in at 1 hour and 23 minutes. But honestly, considering the advantage that game had, I don't really think this is a huge deal. Leveling up and getting the proper moves in Sword took about an hour and a half as well, thanks to the abundance of EXP candies, so getting Pokémon to level 100 for hyper training really wasn't that slow. Anyway, our new total time at this point is 36 hours and 1 minute. Now we just have to get all the proper items. So the first item I try to get is the Culberberry, which can be found in trees in the Pony Wilds. 
What I did was save before entering the area, and then I just checked all threes in there until a Colberberry came up. After that, I bought the Salamancite and the Assault Vest from the Battle Tree with BP that I farmed earlier. And then I bought the Red Orb for Groudon from Haoli City Mall. Stakataka and Tabu Fini just had two different Z crystals, Rock and Fairy, which are both obtained during the story's gameplay. All of this just took 13 minutes. Of course, in part because I farmed the BP earlier in the video. Uh, in fact, Colberberry took most of the time, taking 8 minutes of resets on its own. With that being said, our final time is 36 hours and 14 minutes. When you compare this to the other games, as usual, the PP ups rear their ugly heads and force me to do a miserable grind at the end of the game and video. Having two games here isn't even helpful, because all the PP maxes are in the post game. There are a few ways you can get PP ups and maxes in this game. The first is the lottery, which is something you can do once daily. If you have two or three matching digits, you get a PP up or a PP max. I don't have enough Pokemon for this to be reasonable. You can also get one PP max a day by getting a 40 win streak at the battle tree. This is okay, but it would take like 24 days to acquire everything I need, assuming I can hit 40 wins every day. And also, 40 is like a long time, probably over an hour of battles. There's also the Festival Plaza, but that's just a different lottery that costs FC instead of being free, so I don't think this is a particularly fast method either. Finally, Ultra Moon does let you buy PP ups for 48 BP a piece. You need what, 72 PP ups for a whole team? Each run of Mantine Surf takes 5 minutes. If you get a top score every time, that's 72 runs at 5 minutes each. That's, that's how to do the math. A minimum of 6 hours, assuming you're perfect on every Mantine run and don't have to take breaks to prevent yourselves from injuring your already injured hands. So I did what I could to minimize the work by collecting every PP up and every PP max in the overworld. There's 5 PP maxes total that are easy to get. One from Gladion in the story, and then two are hidden on Mount Honoluki. One is a reward from the Charger Bug puzzle in the post game. And finally, there's one in the vast Pody Canyon that's hidden as well. I also got every PP up. There were seven in total lying around. I could have gotten some in Ultra Sun as well, but I just decided to grind for the rest doing Mantine Surf. This was a horrible, tedious chore. I did it across the span of two days because I didn't want to cause my tendonitis to flare up. It did anyway. I am not a robot, so I did not get a perfect score on Mantine Surf every single time. There were plenty of runs where I would only get 18 or 21 BP. In the end, this took me 12 hours to complete jumping our decent 36 hour time to a gargantuan 48 hour time. This was slightly faster than PP up acquisition in Alpha Sapphire, where it took me 17 hours, but I wouldn't call this fast or reasonable. In Sword, it took like two hours to get all the PP ups. Items like this are much more reasonable to get in the newer games, so it really contributes to their speed. So in total, this game took me 48 hours and 17 minutes. Alpha Sapphire took 85 hours and 25 minutes, and Sword took me 29 hours and one minute. This game is actually smack dab in the middle of both of them. So let's take a look at how this game does in the grand scheme of every meta I have covered and timed so far. This is somehow the third fastest game, narrowly beating out Pokemon White. And that was a metagame without a single restricted Pokemon. But if I am honest with you, this video does not paint the whole picture and the whole truth of what building in these games could be like. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about how the Alola games were even better for building than this video showed. First of all, let's talk about the Pokepelago. I didn't use this feature in the video at all because it's slow. 31 hours for one 252 training session, are you kidding me? Even longer to level 100? How is this good? Well, the beauty of this feature is that it increases the accessibility for people who work full time or go to school full time or both. I was working 40 hours a week and going to college for 20 a week when Sun and Moon released, and I used the Pelago every morning before work and every day when I got home. It helped me so much. I had dozens of gold bottle caps from Isle of Fun, and I was EV training or leveling usually 6 plus Pokemon at a time via Isle Level Up this way while I was at work or school. On top of this, for the low price of $5 a year and an internet connection, you have Pokemon Bank. Did I use Mantine Surf to farm for BP back in the day? Of course I did. But also, passively, if you're a long time player, even a casual one, you can often get thousands of BP via Pokemon Bank. It's a reward that builds up over time for having Pokemon in it. That's all you have to do. On top of that, if you're wonder trading rejects or useless eggs every day from egg RNG like I was, you've got tons of IDs to win the lottery for a PP up every day, and breeding will be sped up because you will have a big community of already decent eggs to share from. What I'm getting at here is simple. While Sun and Moon and their Ultra counterparts are far from perfect for team building, this is the first game to me in any way that felt like Game Freak tried on some level to deal with the accessibility problems that had been plaguing their competitive scene for years. Yes, Alpha Sapphire did make breeding easier, and added 3 IVs onto Legendaries. 
but those are very small baby steps. Alola lets you play the game passively in many different ways, allowing those with less time to be able to compete on a more level playing field. I don't think any of the games since then have replicated this as well as Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon have done. They are all faster, sure, but they require you to be a more active participant in game with stuff like EV training or battle tower grinding or what have you. Not everyone has the time for this and they shouldn't have to have the time for it. This is all coming from someone who enjoys all this in-game team building. I've been making competitive Pokemon without hacks since Gen 4, with or without RNG minips. It's so fun to me that if hacking didn't exist at all, and a VGC player wanted to hire a part-time Pokemon acquirer, I would literally do it. But just because I think it's fun, doesn't mean it should be required for competition. If they want to keep this stuff in, it really should just be relegated to in-game facilities only, like the Battle Tower or the Battle Tree. And one of the things that frustrates me the most is that Game Freak continues to make version-exclusive single-encounter Pokémon. This is absolutely absurd for a competitive game. My only solution here for Groudon was to play for both Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. Nothing else was feasible or reasonable, and I doubt Naoto did anything else different either. In the end, the Alola games are slow, clunky, but at least they're trying. I look forward to seeing you all on my next team builder. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.